is just a spiel I'd like to give you about what I hope will be the future of neurology for the AAN, which I call great neurology. And I believe now is the time for great neurology. Now is the time for us as a professional organization to develop an appropriate, well-implemented curriculum for people to develop careers in global neurology. I'm not talking about experiential planning, because I think we do a reasonable job of that organizationally already, where people have opportunities to go abroad for brief experience. What we haven't done well as a profession is develop a useful curriculum for individuals interested in developing careers in global neurology. And I believe those careers are going to include components of research, education, and advocacy. And those are not necessarily things that we learn in our regular medical education experience. This is important because medicine, including neurology, has evolved very rapidly in the last 20 years. In the 1990s, student exchange programs were largely undergraduate programs in which people went for a month or so abroad to someplace adventurous like the UK or Western Europe. And by the 1998, 15% of medical schools were actually offering exchange programs or study abroad programs. By 2006, it was 30%. By 2007, the Consortium for Universities Interested in Global Health developed, and that has 80 U.S. universities and 30 international um, universities involved in it. So the interest in global health has just exploded in the last 20 years. That largely was originally driven, I believe, by the large amount of resources put into HIV, AIDS care and treatment, which influenced not just health sectors, but global development, and people's interest and awareness of global development. But it, it hasn't stopped there, and there continues to be a huge group in the upcoming generation of trainees who are very globally aware and globally motivated. And we haven't created opportunities for them to really envision what a career in global neurology would look like. I think this is an important responsibility that the organization of the American Academy and our profession as a whole really needs to address. Now, neurology has been very engaged in the global expansion. Um, in the last five years, the American Academy of Neurology, with many of the people here, has developed a very successful global health section. The American Neurologic Association has an international outreach committee. The American Epilepsy Society has actively collaborated with the World Health Organization to develop clinical care protocols and, and clinical decision-making paradigms. Um, the American Brain Foundation, you may not know this, some of the recipients are here, have, have awarded a number of U.S. neurology residents funding to do clinical research fellowships on work that's based abroad. So all of this has happened in neurology in just the last 10 years. Surveys have shown that 60% of residency directors report that they have residents actively acting, asking about opportunities abroad. All of this has occurred in the absence of any well-developed curriculum for career in global neurology. This is not because there's an absence of opportunities. The opportunities to develop a career in global neurology are better today than they've ever been. If you're living and working abroad, as some as of, of us do, there is a growing awareness of the value of neurology locally. So, Non-governmental organizations, private institutions, and governments have an enthusiasm for trying to tap into neurologic expertise. We have people here who are lecturers at foreign universities. We have people here who are sponsored by NGOs to do work abroad. That work involves clinical care, teaching, all sorts of things. And those opportunities are out there, but we don't necessarily take full advantage of them. From the U.S. perspective, you know, we're very fortunate in global health. Um, the head of the NIH, when he came into his role, named global health as one of his top five priorities. And he has followed that through, um, influencing the institutes to follow a global health curriculum within their portfolios. There are financial motivations for NINDS and others to actually have a global portfolio. We're now more than a decade away from the very transformative beginning of the brain disorders program that the Fogarty International Center sponsored. And what we see today is that both within the federal government funding as well as private funding, there are groups that used to just work globally on public health problems that now understand that neurologic disorders fall within public health problems. 
There are neurologic institutes funding things that now realize they want to reach out and be global. All these opportunities are fairly new, but they're occurring in the absence of any clear guidance or direction for our young trainees who think that they want to develop a career in global health. There's no consensus and no guidance. This is really unfortunate because it's bad for our trainees. I think we lose, as a global neurologist, we lose a lot of really good people who just get confused and concerned that there's no path and no direction, and so they, they find something else to do. Or they decide it can just be an interesting hobby, but it can't be a career for them. Under the worst of circumstances, we send people abroad poorly prepared, and we expose them to unsafe circumstances. And even when just poorly done, people waste time and money trying to follow a career path with no direction. Poorly prepared trainees who aren't properly supported are also responsible for some bad host experiences. I have an anthropology friend who describes it as the unprepared inflicted upon the unsuspecting. <laughs> and we can do better than that. We're certainly capable of doing better than that. Now this is not universally true. There's certainly particular programs that are well developed and people who are quite vested in educating people before they go. But again, these are much more geared towards experiences. And what I'm talking about is as a profession, developing a plan for people's career development. Why is there no existing global health career trajectory, curriculum, et cetera? There are many reasons. One important thing to recognize is if you put on, pretend you're a chair, put on your chair hat, and think about all the responsibilities the chair of a department has. They're quite substantial. They have the clinical care service aspects that they're responsible for at their institutions. They have the educational component, and that has generally very little to do with global health, at least the core components don't. They have financial responsibilities. They have outreach responsibilities. And for them to invest a lot of time and energy and infrastructure in global health is a challenge. The places that can do it are the places that have big departments where they can really allow the flexibility for faculty members to be engaged. But for the most part, it's not very effective for a chair of a department to decide to have a large global health section because that's going to draw away from a lot of the main purposes of that department. It's not very practical or desirable to pick a single foreign site and say that site's going to be where global neurology happens, right? Kind of counterintuitive. And I think the most important thing, and, and I think we all here have started to appreciate um, in, in the past generation or two the importance of diversity. When you sit in a department, whether you realize it or not, <laughs> you tend to think a lot alike within the same department. So if you've been in a department for many years and then you change, you realize that there's sort of a certain similarity. And the ideal global health curriculum will not evolve from a single department. It will evolve from us taking advantage of all the strengths and diversity of our profession, and that goes far beyond a single department. In addition, the best global health curriculum must have serious input from outside of the U.S., and it must have in serious input from professions outside of our own as neurologists. We need input from anthropologists and sociologists and ethicists, and we don't necessarily have those individuals in any one department of neurology. We wouldn't dream of handing medical students a bag full of neurologic examination equipment and tossing them out on the floor and saying, good luck. But to some extent, when we have young professionals who are interested in developing a career in global neurology, that's about the level of direction and service we offer them. And I think we can do better than that as a profession. So what I'm proposing is that the American Academy of Neurology, through the global health section, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui and friends, um, we'll consider developing and endorsing a program in global health career development for neurologists. And I think that program needs to include aspects of research, education, and advocacy training. Now, I've worked with a group of colleagues on a draft of what this agenda would look like. The colleagues were about a dozen of us, uh, including a number of neurologists, but not limited to neurologists. A largely American neurologist, but representatives from Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa were also involved. And we sort of developed a draft of what we thought this curriculum would look like. I call it a draft because, again, it's a first pass, but I think it's a beginning and a, a kind of a point to start thinking about. There are four components to this. 
One is the mentoring or the mentorship component, which is obviously critical to any career development plan um, in any of our subspecialties. Then there's a critical contents component, and the critical contents include uh, regional knowledge or regional development if, because most people will pick a one region to work in. There's also a nuts and bolts and a toolbox. I'm going to talk about each of them briefly to give you a sense of what we thought would be included in that component of training. So the mentoring. Mentorship is central to almost anybody's career success. And um, I think it's very difficult, even in departments, we assign a new resident, a senior mentor, and over time, often they finally find the mentor they should have had, but you can't pair people up very easily. So this is one of the more challenging pieces, but it can never be left out. When we think about mentorship for somebody who has a global neurology career path, it's going to be a mentoring team. And the minimum on that team needs to be someone from their home institution and someone from wherever they're working abroad or someone with more of a global experience. And that's the minimum. They may need mentors in specific content areas if the two mentors at the key institutions don't have the expertise they need. Okay, they may need that. They may, they may need a whole mentoring team, but at the very least, they need somebody from their home institution who knows the expectations and the demands of that institution can help negotiate issues and be their advocate, very much like that person would be if they were just a junior faculty in that department. But they also need a host mentor. And this is the really challenging bit. As a faculty at a US program, implicitly or explicitly, I am paid to mentor students and help residents, and that's part of my job. It is not my African's colleague's job to mentor my students. So we have to think very carefully about that expectation and recognize that there needs to be some exchange. Now, does that mean paying them a salary? Perhaps. Perhaps it means taking some of their students, <laughs> right? An exchange. Maybe it means helping support some of their staff. But we have to be very cognizant that that's a sensitive part of this mentoring team, that we can't be expecting services from people who don't have that obligation and for the most part are very much overcommitted already. And yet failure to have a local mentor is one of those fatal flaws that can occur in a global neurology career path. We also need to then think about the critical contents. And one of the key critical contents is a regional overview for people who are going to work in any one area. It's a little bit like having a map. And I believe that if you're sending someone abroad, let them create the regional overview. It should include basic things like, what's the geopolitical history of where you're going? Kind of important. I don't look a lot like the people I work with when I'm in Zambia. Kind of important to know that when somebody doesn't know me meets me, what might it mean to them the way I appear? Kind of important, knowing about the history of a place and its people. Knowing a little bit about the cultural context. How about the general health of the population and how are they accessing primary care? You really should have that in your back pocket before you appear somewhere. These are principles I think even the experiential travelers need to be aware of. There's also really important information out there about the general neurologic burden of disease in locations. Now sometimes it's extrapolated data, but if you were going to go practice neurology somewhere or be a trainee in neurology somewhere, it would seem very rational to learn as much as you could about the neurologic burden of disease in that location before you arrive. It may mean that you need to learn more about neurologic tropical diseases before, not, um, neglected tropical diseases before you go. It may mean you need to learn something about refugee health before you go, but you, a lot of preparation could occur before people arrive. And then this may seem strange because we actually don't formally make people do it in our own health system, though perhaps we should, but before going abroad, either for an experiential or a career issue, it would be really helpful if people learned about the structure, the function, and the resources of the medical education system, the healthcare system, and the public health system. This is all basic information that people would do well to have structured and, and gather themselves before having a global experience. In terms of other critical content, now some people with a better uh, liberal education than myself, I was like a chemistry major, might have had the benefit of these as undergraduates. But understanding issues in international development, you know, there's a whole body 
of a, a whole body of knowledge, a whole academic study of international development. And we're pretty unaware of that, and some of the bra basic principles of international development could well inform some of the decisions we make when we go into places and try to provide medical services or help develop medical systems. Understanding issues about en community engagement and, trans and translational advocacy. So how do you engage a community, and then if you have something that you think could be helpful, how does that translate into policy and change? We are not taught that in medical school. But when you work in an international setting and you're trying to do effective work, those are pretty important skills and knowledge to have. I think it's also important that we give people some insights into the international health arena. What do I mean by that? When you go to work into a foreign setting, it would be really helpful to know how is their hierarchy set up in the health system? What do you know about the Minister of Health? Who is the WHO? Who are they responsible to? Where are they located? Where are their emissaries? What's UNAIDS? What's USA? You know, all of these important entities. You need to know who they are, what they do, who they're responsible to, how their agendas and missions are set, because they really permeate these environments. And it would be a little bit like walking into a hospital and not knowing that the patients are in beds. You know, it's the sort of thing that you really need to understand. And it's knowledge that can be gained relatively easily with some very basic instruction. Finally, and something I think I've only become aware of in the last five years, if people are going to be working in tertiary healthcare settings, which they may well be doing, understanding some of the challenges and issues in our usual neurodiagnostic um, a, arena would be very helpful. You know, why isn't there an EEG machine? Why isn't it working? What's it cost? Crazy things. Uh, MRIs are great. Do you know what an MRI service contract costs? Maybe that shouldn't be the priority. Um, lab facilities can be limited understanding what some of those constraints are could be very important in your healthcare decision making. Those are the critical content. Toolbox, and this is particularly important for the career trajectory folks, toolbox would be becoming familiar with all the potential tools that you could use and be brought to bear on research in these settings. It doesn't mean that you're an expert in them. It's unlikely you're going to become an expert in all of them, but knowing what's available. And I would put telemedicine, teleneurology at the top. Somebody brought a question up about that. What are, th what are the value? What's the limitation? How can it be used effectively? When, when is it not the ideal tool? So teleneurology and teleeducation, and there's a lot of um, sessions on that this week. As with most of our research career trajectories, some passing familiarity with epidemiology and biostatistics is extremely helpful. And I think health services research and um, implementation sciences, again, not being an expert, but understanding the value of these fields, the experts you could collaborate, and who is the appropriate person to potentially tap into if the problems in the environment that you're working in would be amenable to those expertise. And then finally, something we're not particularly good at in neurology is we really need, if we're going to be working in a, in a setting that we're unfamiliar with, we really need to think about qualitative methods, really rigorous qualitative methods to inform perhaps the questions we ask. This is not something most of us will become familiar with in our usual medical education path. And then finally, the kind of boring nuts and bolts, but the thing you never want to forget, are things like personal safety, teaching people the different ways in different areas to travel safely, to know when not to travel, uh, to know how to alert the necessary U.S. systems, including their own university. Many people don't know within their own university how to keep the university informed about where they are so if there's a problem they can get out. So they understand the real risks to their health. You know, where I live and work, the real risk to your health is probably being on the roads, road traffic accidents, probably far more dangerous than bungee jumping or anything else you're going to do. Um, so personal safety and learning strategies for optimizing that. Professional safety, regulatory compliance. Anybody here who's worked with NIH or the government knows that there's an unbelievable burden of uh, compliance to be dealt with. And that's an important thing to learn. And when you add international aspects to your work, that becomes more complex. And it's quite hard. I, I've never really had, it's one of those Learn by, learn by making mistakes and having a few good program officers take you by the hand and smack you and show you how to do it right. And it would be really helpful to, s to actually structure that information so people would have access to it, and I've never seen that occur. But the other important thing is compliance in your own environment. So if you're working in a foreign country, do not assume there are not compliance issues. 
You know, you need to know, do you need to have a medical license? How do you get one? What's that take? You need to know what the human ethics review committees are there. If you have a good local mentor, that will happen. But if you don't, that's one of the problems you can run into is, is inadvertently disrespecting or actually disregarding the local compliance issues. And then finally, for those people interested in, in, grant, in research, learning a bit about the challenges of grants management and finance, when you're trying to move a dollar from one place to another, it can be a lot harder than you think. And uh, it would be really, again, helpful to have some structured information for individuals who are trying to build that aspect of their career. So as a discipline, I really think we owe it to our trainees and the next generation to develop a global neurology training curriculum that isn't aimed just at experiential issues, but is aimed at helping people craft the careers that they can craft. We owe it to our trainees. We owe it to those unsuspecting hosts. We don't want to have those bad experiences. I'm quite certain that poor preparation and education of traveling scholars is one of the key causes of parachute science that we've all heard about, uh, of brain drain contributing to the brain drain, and really of resource misuse. On the other side, when you look at the energies and expertise and priorities of the upcoming generation in neurology, if we can harness that, we have an incredibly powerful force for addressing the inequities and the global burden of disease that we've been hearing about in some of these other sessions. If that can be harnessed and fully utilized, it could be incredibly powerful. But it is not going to happen if we leave our young trainees sort of floating around just hoping that things work out or abandoning the issue because it's just not doable. We can do it. We have the expertise. We have the collaborations. We have the international colleagues. What we need is the will. And I hope you will all agree that it is time for great neurology.